my name is Natalie Gertz Young. Um, a lot of you already know me. I see a lot of familiar faces out there today. Um, and I am the Education and Information Coordinator for the Lake County Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm also a naturalist at the Meadow Marsh Nature Center, so I might look familiar to some of you for that reason. And today we're gonna talk all about native plants, how we might wanna use them in our landscape. So we're gonna get started here. So in order to understand, we're gonna give you guys a lot of background information. So we're gonna talk a little bit about soil and water conservation districts, um, kind of the problem with the American lawn. We're gonna go wrong, talk a little bit about uh, invasive plants and then counter that with why we might wanna plant native plants instead. Um, and then we're gonna give you lots of suggestions for your landscape. Okay, so first we're gonna talk a bit about soil and water conservation districts and kind of what they do. So in the 1930s, so a lot of disasters started happening across the United States, largely uh, on farmland. And so people caused these problems. They cut down all the trees. They plowed the prairies. They planted things like corn and wheat over and over and over and over and over again, never letting their, their fields rest. And then we had some natural disasters that compounded with that too. So we had big droughts. Um, and also we had like, the, when it did rain, there would be these big, big gully washer rainstorms. So it caused a lot of problems. Um, so like this. So uh, anybody know what this happened after? Yeah, this happened during the Dust Bowl. Um, I believe this photo was taken after, what's it called? Black Sunday, I believe it was called. It was the day when, um, one of the many storms, but this is one of the worst dust storms, when sediment and soil was blown all the way from the Plains states and it, would, it was actually falling on New York City. So it actually blew it that far. Um, and that topsoil is very precious. <laughs> um, it can take 100 years for one inch of topsoil to form under good conditions, so that's pretty bad. They lost several feet of topsoil during the Dust Bowl era. Uh, but it wasn't just confined to the prairies that held, had all these problems. Um, this photo could have been taken here in Ohio. So here we had these problems with these big rainstorms and it would wash all the topsoil off of a growing, um, off of a farm field. Big problems. So uh, they decided to create the Soil Conservation Service and that ultimately eventually ended up um, creating organizations like the Soil and Water Conservation District. But the Soil Conservation Service promoted keeping our soils covered, like with cover crops. Yes, one of them that they promoted was kudzu, but we'll get to invasive species later. Uh, crop rotation and strip cropping. So here would be a picture of that. So making sure that you have like strips of different crops. Stream buffers and grass waterways. So putting some vegetation in place in order to make sure that those, that, that sediment doesn't get washed into our rivers. We also paid farmers to leave that farmland fallow. So it could give that soil a break, let it rest. So that might be what that looks like. Um, and they also created the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, so back then, of course, this was the Great Depression. There were, you know, a lot of young men with no jobs and no prospects. And essentially, the Civilian Conservation Corps gave them a job, gave them housing, gave them food. It was very hard labor. It was hard work, but they were grateful for it. They uh, planted trees, uh, grew trees. There was lots of tree nurseries, uh, cover crops, erosion control dams. So here's a statue. There's lots of these at state parks all around the United States. So next time you're at a state park, keep an eye out, see if you can find this guy. Uh, and this is kind of a, an example of a project that they might have done. So these are erosion control dams. And these, I believe, are actually from Ohio. They're from um, Wayne State Forest, maybe? They're, they're from further south in Ohio. Conservation districts, we were the local boots on the ground, um, and we still are. Here in Lake County, um, people don't know, but we are like the only county agency that was actually voted into existence by the citizenry. So um, in 1946, we were voted that we should exist, and we started to exist in January of 1947. And we really started out as protecting soil and water resources primarily for agriculture. Um, but today, things have changed. We're not all farmers in here. Most of us probably live in suburban 
houses and suburban developments, and those have different needs than farmers do. Um, so we do lots of different things. So here in Lake County, we do specialized agriculture. So we have trees. We grow grapes and trees and specialty crops here. We don't grow a lot of corn, soy, and wheat. Um, smart development, so how can we develop our land so that it's a smart way to do it? Um, how can we protect those important lands through easements? Um, making sure that our water quality is kept good, kept with stormwater prevention, planning for our watersheds, um, and erosion and sediment control practices. Um, also, we provide landowner assistance, and we do backyard conservation and programs with both children and adults alike, like this program we're doing tonight. So on to kind of the issues with landscaping here in the United States. So Americans really, we love our lawns. We absolutely love our lawns. Um, they're the most grown crop in the US, in fact. Um, so if you were to put all the lawns in the United States together in one place, it would be the size of all of Pennsylvania and half of Ohio. It's a lot of lawn. Um, it's the single most irrig irrigated crop Technically, our lawns are a crop. It's the single most irrigated crop in the United States. Here's a fun quote. So, I've long maintained that the American lawn is one of the greatest mass brainwashings of all time. How we voluntarily signed up to spend untold hours growing and cutting a non-native monoculture which we lace with poisons to kill plants and insects never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> there is a famous quote that uh, the wastage of soil and moisture resources on farm, grazing, and forest lands is a menace to the national welfare. That was FDR who said that. Um, and so we have to think about, are we maybe wasting some of those resources in keeping our lawns the way they are? And if we think about the diversity in our lawns, a, old, a long time ago when lawns really just started to take place, they weren't all the exact same species of grass all throughout. They may have had clover and dandelions and all these things mixed in, and it was socially acceptable for that to be the case. Um, now, if depending on the type of community you live in, that may not be okay anymore. So, um, and not everybody is comfortable being that neighbor, um, like, like, like I am. <laughs> Not everybody puts a prairie in their backyard. <laughs> I'm looking at someone and he's looking around. Um, so we essentially have low species diversity, lots of non-native plants, um, and so they require, they're, they're, they kind of require a lot of inputs too. They require a lot of watering, they require fertilizing, um, and all of this actually creates a food desert for our local insects. And our local insects are the backbone of the food chain in, um, in any ecosystem. So it's a very, very sad monarch butterfly. There's nothing to eat. There's nothing to lay their eggs on. It's very sad. But if we maybe traded out those few non-native bushes and that uh, Kentucky bluegrass lawn there, for something more like this, then uh, you know that would be a lot better. In fact, the one picture um, in the top corner there, that is actually a picture of a rain garden that is literally just on the corner of the street up here. So, And now we're going to talk a little bit about invasive plants. So I mentioned that a lot of times in lawns, we tend to, I mean, in our normal lawns and landscaping, we tend to, to plant a lot of non-native plants. Um, so we're going to talk about plants that are not only non-native, but they're also invasive. So there are lots of species of alien plants, 3,400 of them, um, and they've invaded over 200 million acres in the United States. Um, and that's really expensive. It costs us $123 billion every year. And these are like 2009 estimates, so this is higher today. This is in clogged waterways. This is in um, what damage this does to farmland and farm crops. So there's a lot of ways that this number fig figures. But, but the source of a lot of these plants is actually our home landscapes. And I will say soil and waters, we are not innocent in this. So um, in fact, we have promoted most of the species that I'm going to show you here that are invasives <laughs> at one point or another. All right, so here we have autumn olive. So you'll see this one along the highways. 
Um, you can tell it's automobile because it has very silvery foliage. We have multiflora rose. This one was planted as living fence for livestock. Um, it has big thorns and it gets real big and tall. It is heck of a lot cheaper than barbed wire. Um, and you know, the USDA said, oh, and it has those little rose hips that the birds love, which is fine and dandy until those birds then deposit those seeds everywhere. <laughs> um, and that's currently the problem. This was also used as rootstock for ornamental roses. So that's another way that this was introduced to the landscape. Um, you guys probably recognize this one because it's everywhere. Um, this is European buckthorn. That one was actually introduced as like a hedge plant because it's native to, uh, it, this was brought over by founding fathers because this is what they had in their gardens, you know, back in the old country, back in, in England. Uh, this is uh, black alder, European black alder. This tends to invade wet areas alongside rivers and streams. My most hated one, Scalary Pear, also called Bradford Pear or Cleveland Select. You will see these in the springtime, brilliant with their blooms and stinking up the place because they do not smell good. Um, and we'll show you another picture of these this in a minute and show you why this is such a terrible one. Um, and all of these, all of these plants are either invasive or on the invasive watch list. So we're kind of expecting them in the past few, next few years to kind of become a problem. So English ivy, uh, can reed canary grass, Japanese barberry, winter creeper, butterfly bush. Yes, I know, beloved butterfly bush, but I find them in the woods all the time and they definitely weren't planted there by people. <laughs> um, honeysuckles, there are native honeysuckles, but most of them that we see are not native. So why do, but why do we want to plant natives instead? Like we get that the other ones, they spread, they get out of control. It's that cost money to control them. But why do we really want to plant natives? So one, they are really great for wildlife. So starting with, starting with the bees to birds, to everything that eats all of those things. So they're really great for native wildlife, for, um, for nectar sources, for nesting sources. So we, we need them for wildlife, definitely. Uh, they also help us control stormwater. So stormwater is all that water that hits our roofs and our sidewalks and our roads, and it goes in the storm drain and nothing treats it. It just goes in the storm drain and then goes straight into the nearest creek, stream or river and ends up in Lake Erie where 40,000 Lake County residents get their drinking water from. So um, it's a lot easier to keep that water clean to begin with than it is to treat it once it's already dirty. So keeping water out of there is the much better solution. So, um, and why do native plants do such a good job of that? Because they have very long, deep roots. And those deep roots poke lots of little holes in the soil, essentially making it like a great big sponge. They also contribute a lot of organic matter to the soil, with, which also allows it to hold on to more water. And you will see in the little red circle how sad the roots of that turf grass in our lawn is. Its roots are only about as deep as the blade is. So if you cut your lawn to two inches, those roots are only about two inches below. Also in our lawns, we're, if we use our lawns, you know, we play fetch with the dog, we mow it, we do all these things on our lawn. So it also compacts the soil. Our lawn actually acts a lot like green concrete. It does not absorb water the same way um, all these other native plants, if they were planted there, would absorb water. Also, our native plants are ad they're adapted to our area, so they just require fewer inputs. So, you know, we might ha not have to pay Chemlon to come by and, and spray our stuff because they don't really need it. We want the bugs that visit them. Also, this, by planting natives, especially more aggressive natives, which I'm not afraid of, um, we can kind of give those invasive plants a little bit of a run for their money. It can help compete with them. So this is purple loosestrife, which lots of people have planted in their yards because it's pretty, but it's also really bad invasive. And native plants look great. They don't, they don't have to look, you don't have to go full wildflower meadow. I always say you don't have to go full wildflower meadow. If you want to, more power to you. But you don't have to. You can make your native plants just be beautiful.
So now we're just going to talk about some native plants for your landscape. Some of these categories are based upon type of plant, so like tree or shrub. Some of them are based more upon, um, do you have shade, do you have sun? So we're gonna go through some of those. So first we're gonna start with native plants for your landscape that like sun. So uh, this is probably the easiest category. These are, a lot of these plants we might be familiar with. So we have New England asters. These are just finishing up blooming now. Great late season nectar provider. Um, Pensamen digitalis, or uh, beard tongue. This one uh, blooms kind of at a time of year when not a lot else is blooming. So this is kind of that late June when everything's putting out its leaves and not a lot is actually in bloom. So great for pollinators. Um, tolerates a wide range of soil conditions, so it's a really great plant. Then we have black-eyed Susan, probably one of the first native plants to like really become mainstream in landscaping. I'm more of a fan of the brown-eyed Susan. I think they're a little bit less aggressive, um, but black-eyed Susans are beautiful. Butterfly weed, if you have dry, droughty soils, like if you maybe live somewhere along Route 20 or Route 84, you have very droughty soils, um, this plant will just be very happy in your yard. Cardinal flower, uh, likes it a little bit wetter. Absolutely beautiful, rich red blooms. Hummingbird magnet. Uh, wild columbine, this is one of our early spring bloomers. Cup plant, this one gets to be very, very tall. <laughs> um, and if you plant one, you will have lots to share and not a lot of time. So, so keep that in mind. <laughs> Goldenrod, probably one of the best pollen and nectar providing plants in the fall. Um, this, is, this is a great one. Um, there are species of goldenrods that are not super aggressive too. So like you, you don't have to have a garden of exclusively goldenrod um, if you just plant the right species. Ironweed, love that bright, bright purple color at the end of the summer, early fall. A little before that is Joe Pie Weed, another really great one. Mountain Mint, if you have any mountain mint in your yard, you know that like you can literally hear the mountain mint when it's in bloom because it is just covered in bees like the whole time. Obedient plant, not named obedient plant because it doesn't spread, just a warning. Um, it's named that because you can actually move the flowers and they'll stay where you put them. Um, but yes, there is a cultivar called Miss Manners that is well behaved. And so here we have, um, this is Scarlet Bee Balm or Monarda didyma, another hummingbird magnet. And I just love this one, Queen of the Prairie. It just looks like cotton candy on a stick. Why wouldn't you want to plant that in your yard? What was uh, Queen of the Prairie. Okay, moving on to ones for shade. So we have Big Leaf Aster. This one, if it's happy, it'll spread and almost form kind of like a little bit of a tallish ground cover. Um, it gets to be one and a half feet tall probably. The leaves are not evergreen, but it does provide really nice cover in the summertime. Uh, bugbane, this is a nice statement plant. It gets to be tall, it has these big spikes of white flowers. This is really great for that transition from maybe a wooded area into your yard. Um, a really nice transition plant. Uh, so here we have blue cohosh. Another early spring bloomer. This one definitely likes it very shady. Wild geranium, this one can form a nice ground cover too. Um, if you plant this one and it's in a little bit sunnier of a spot, its leaves will actually turn red in the fall too. So that one's kind of fun. Mayapple, they're just, who doesn't want some little cute little umbrellas growing in their yard? Blue phlox, kind of more of a delicate ground cover. Um, this one's really nice to mix with other, uh, with some of these other shady plants. Solomon seal, 
A lot of, a, a lot of these shade plants are uh, spring ephemeral, so they're real active that early in the spring. And then a lot of times, a lot of their uh, foliage will persist throughout most of the summer, um, but then uh, maybe die back by the fall. Uh, American spikenard, or uh, Aurelia. It's kind of like sub, sub, shrub-ish, so that one gets to be a little taller. And, you know, violets get a lot of hate. People don't like them in their yard. I love violets. I actually use them as like green mulch in my gardens. I let them grow in my gardens, and you don't feel bad about pulling them out because there will always be more. Um, so you just, if, if they're crowding out the plants you don't want, you just pull them out. If not, think of it as a place you don't have to mulch. And they are the host plant for uh, great spang spangled fritillaries. So why wouldn't you want more fritillaries in your yard? Uh, there's also lots of native plants that you can plant as ground covers. Where I live, everybody who lived there before me planted every one of the bad invasive ground covers, shade tolerant ground covers. That's literally all I have at my house. It is a full-time job. I would have to quit my job and work for five years straight to even make a dent. It's terrible. Um, so plant these instead. Um, so we can do some Christmas ferns. and Those will grow in poor soils and rocky and droughty soils. They're persistent throughout the whole year. They're evergreen, which is why they're called Christmas ferns, because they were traditionally used in Christmas decorations. Um, foam flower. There's lots of different cultivars of this, too. So you can have a little bit of different leaf color, a little bit of different uh, leaf shape. Wild ginger. If wild ginger is happy, it will form a nice thick mat, but looks really more like one of those traditional ornamental thick ground covers. And it has the coolest flowers. They're like along the soil and they're a rich like maroon color and they bloom pretty early in the spring. And they don't smell nice because they're pollinated by flies. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not gonna like crawl on the ground and stick your nose in them because that would be very uncomfortable. Um, and then wintergreen, which if you break a leaf off and you give it a sniff, they it, it it's very strong of wintergreen. Um, this one also tends to like droughty soils too. Grasses and sedges. So I think a lot of times in our gardens we tend to overlook the grasses and the sedges. They provide a nice difference in texture. Um, and if you get one, the right kinds of ones, they might even stand up all throughout some of the winter. Okay, maybe not everywhere. I live in Chardon where we just get so much snow that everything is just immediately trampled down. But if you don't get as much snow. Uh, so big blue stem, it's tall, it has like, it looks like a turkey foot. Kind of it's, its seed heads look like a turkey foot, which is one of the reasons why it's also called turkey grass. Um, little blue stem is much shorter to the ground. Uh, I, I, it kind of sticks upright, um, kind of it's short, it's spiky. Um, there are also cultivars that are a little bit more upright and a little bit firmer, so they do stand up a little bit better. Um, and this one is very easy to find at local nurseries, too. There's lots of sedges. There's a sedge for every condition. Um, one of my ultimate goals is in my dry shade front yard to just get rid of all the grass and just plant Pennsylvania sedge and maybe mow it once a year if I feel like it. Um, but it's just these fun little tufts. It just looks like a little fairy path. It's just, it's just delightful. Uh, Switchgrass. There is a height and color of switchgrass for whatever you want. If you have enough sun, you can plant switchgrass and you can find, there's probably 30 cultivars. Some are super red like this one. Some are tall. Uh, one's called Cloud Nine and it's really, really tall and its seed heads look like a big fluffy cloud. Um, really beautiful. Um, really can fit whatever niche you need it to in your garden. And this is probably my favorite of all of these prairie drop seed. They just look like these cute little little floofs in the ground. And here you can see it planted with some echinacea, purple cone flowers, and it's it just it's a really nice, lovely, whimsical filler between them. Vines. Can't forget about vines. Vines have their place if they're put in the right location. So American bittersweet. So we're so familiar now with seeing the, uh, the Asiatic bittersweet, um, which has this, you can see, has an orange seed capsule around the seed and it has a red seed inside. Um, 
and the non-native version that is taking over our woodlands has a yellow seed capsule. Um, so that's one of the ways that you can tell the difference between them. I will say American bittersweet is not one you want to like plant up against your house because it is aggressive and can like tear your house. So put it on something that it's allowed to do its thing on. Uh, Devil's darning needles, this is also called virgin's bower. This is our native clematis and um, it will spread rapidly. So let's say you have a chain lick fence and you just want that sucker covered in a vine and you want it to happen in like one to two years. Plant a couple of these, it'll be covered. Um, so it is an aggressive spreader, but it is easy to pull out. So if it goes somewhere you don't want it, it's pretty easy to manage. Um, you can also cut it all the way down to the ground. I do recommend doing that if you want to keep it a little bit more under control. Cut it all the way down to the ground at the end of the season. Just beautiful, scarlet honeysuckle. This one is a nice neighbor. If you put it in the sun, you get more blooms and more berries. And with those red tube-shaped flowers, you're gonna get lots of hummingbirds with this one. And people hate, Virgi hate on Virginia creeper, but I absolutely love it. It has great fall foliage color. Um, it lives in lots of, it'll grow just about anywhere. Um, just don't accidentally, you know, plant poison ivy instead. Although some people do react to this one, but um, it's just because you can react, some people just can react to just about any plant. It has great berries that are good for uh, migrating birds, which is why I also let the poison ivy stay in some places in my yard. Um, so pond edges and wet areas. So if you don't live along Route 84 or 20, you probably have the opposite problem in your yard, and that is that it is wet. Uh, cardinal flower, as we mentioned before, loves it wet. Um, there's also its relative, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that also likes it wet. Uh, blue flag iris. Blue flag iris loves it wet. It's a, it grows along the edges of marshes and swamps. It's very, very happy there. Um, but it also tolerates droughty air conditions pretty well too, so it'll tolerate your yard. Um, if you have it pretty wet, lizard tail. You can see why it's called lizard tail. It's got that cool swoopy flower. It'll grow in pretty much standing water. Great blue lobelia. So this one's a little shorter than cardinal flower. A little bit, spreads a little bit more. Cardinal flower sometimes will just disappear from people's gardens. This one doesn't tend to do that and swamp milkweed. So we're providing some food for our larval monarchs with some swamp milkweed. Um, and swamp milkweed tends to not spread as much as common milkweed. So sometimes people don't want to plant common milkweed because it is, can be a bit aggressive. Um, it spreads through these colonies. It forms these great big colonies. And swamp milkweed doesn't really do that. It just kind of forms clumps. It might spread by seed, but it's not going to spread by rhizomes under the soil quite so much. Um, so this one is a much more better behaved plant for a garden um, than probably common milkweed would be. Ant ferns, Christmas fern, we already mentioned it. Intermediate wood fern. The great thing about ferns is deer don't like them. For the most part, deer don't like ferns. So if you have a big deer issue in your yard, ferns can be a really good solution, um, especially if you're, you're shady, they can be a really, really good solution for you. Lady fern, marginal shield fern. If you want some edible fiddleheads in the springtime, you can plant some ostrich fern. And royal fern, just, it's just so, it is, it's grand looking. It's royal looking. It's great. And that one likes it pretty, really wet too. So if you have that wetness, both the ostrich and the royal fern would be really happy in, in a very wet spot. Shrubs. We have, we have a wealth of shrubs. There, there is no excuse to plant a non-native shrub in your yard because we have so many beautiful, beautiful natives. Um, so bayberry. Bayberry is also salt tolerant. Keep that in mind. It, keeps, it has semi-persistent evergreen leaves, um, so it looks great in the wintertime too. Button bush. If you have one of those super, super soupy wet places in your yard, just plant a button bush. They literally could grow in a bathtub. Um, and then just sit back and count all the butterflies that it attracts. I planted one in my parents' yard, and my mom sends me pictures every year of how many butterflies she can find on it all at the same time. 
chokeberry, black chokeberry, great, great uh, food for birds, great fall color. Uh, gray dogwood, red osier dogwood, um, live, grow in the same type of conditions. Red osier dogwood has really, really nice winter color, really nice winter interest. Nanny berry, this likes it pretty wet too. Um, that's a great one. Nine bark, it's called nine bark because it has very peely exfoliating bark, which makes it really, it, it's more winter interest. But as it peels, it peels from the top down and curls under, so it looks like the number nine. I get asked that question every time is, why is it called nine bark? I looked it up, that's why it's called nine bark. Uh, purple flowering raspberry, yes, also related to thimbleberry, common names are confusing. Um, so this one does get edible berries, um, they make really good jam, um, they're very tasty. The deer really like it at my house, but it just comes back, it's a champ, it doesn't, it just keeps on going. Spice bush. Deer do not like spice bush. So if you have a shady lawn, a shady yard, spice bush is a great, they're, it's very strongly like flavored essentially. So they're not big fans of it. Then we have fragrant sumac, another one deer don't like. Anything that's very strongly scented, um, deer don't tend to like. That, that one stays short too. There's also a cultivar called low grow that stays very low to the ground. And Shining sumac. So shining sumac, it's a little bit taller. It gets those red berries, just like the staghorn sumac that you might be used to seeing on the side of the road. Um, so, but it stays a little bit shorter. And winter berry. Winter berry tolerates it wet, it tolerates it dry. Um, this one does require a male and a female plant, although some nurseries are now selling ones that are female plants with one male branch grafted onto them so that they can still get all the berries except for that one branch. <laughs> um, so, but like one male can pollinate like several, like a pretty good number of, of female ones. So you just have to have them close enough together. Um, another good thing about winterberry is it does have berries and the birds do eat the berries, but they are not their favorite. So they will eat other stuff in your yard before they'll eat this one. Um, and then, so you'll have pretty berries on there probably through beginning of January, depending on how many food resources are around. Small trees, pagoda dogwoods. This is a shady, shady loving tree, small tree. Um, hawthorns, these are really great for tough urban places. They can take whatever you throw at them. Uh, hophorn beams good understory tree. Service berries, so we have a couple different service berries here. Plant a service berry instead of calorie pear. That's gonna be my, if you don't, if you go with anything today, plant a service berry instead of a calorie pear. They bloom at the same time. These have delicious berries. You have to fight the birds for them, but they're delicious. Um, and it's not a terrible invasive tree that smells bad. Staghorn sumac. Some people like a staghorn sumac. Some people hate them. Some people love them. Uh, and uh, witch hazel. So here's this one. This one just finished blooming. So a super, super late bloomer. Um, understory tree. Really kind of providing interest at a time when there isn't a lot interesting going on. Shade trees. So these are your big, your big trees here. So yellow birch. If you got a wet spot, look at that golden exfoliating bark. Ohio buckeye. You either love buckeyes or you hate them. Cucumber tree. I cannot tell you how many times I've been leading a hike and somebody has picked one of those up off the ground and said, what is this? It's a seed pod from the cucumber magnolia. <laughs> maples. We have, we have a wealth of maples. So black maple, red maple, sugar maple, silver maple. Oaks, oaks are one of the biggest bang for your buck trees as far as attracting insect and pollinator species. Um, tons of insects use them as host plants. Um, and then, then you also have the added benefit of the nuts that provide for other wildlife like small mammals. Sassafras, nothing has fall color quite like sassafras. 
tulip tree, if you want a fast growing tree um, that's going to grow tall and straight and big, tulip tree is a good choice. And I have to save my favorite tree for last, the black gum, also called the tupelo. It has the most beautiful leaves and they're glossy and they're beautiful. Um, if you have a female, you will get blackberries that will provide food for birds. It has cool, chunky bark, and it can grow. It can make it makes a great street tree too. So it tolerate it can tolerate urban pollution pretty well. Evergreens. We got cedars, hemlocks. Unfortunately, it's not a great idea to plant a hemlock in your yard right now. Um, we do have the hemlock woolly adelgid and the hemlock elongate scale. Um, that are kind of affecting the health of hemlocks around here. So, you know, may maybe it's better to plant something that is less likely to die in your yard. But if you want one, go for it. Common juniper, mountain laurel, eastern white pine. This is our only native pine to Ohio. We're kind of in that weird spot where we're too far north for the southern pines and we're too far south for the northern pines. We're kind of just at the absolute south part of uh, the eastern white pines range. And I wish I could find a good place to source these because I would love it if we could get some Canada use because they are uh, at least native to our region. Um, but most of the use that you can buy in nurseries are unfortunately the non-native ones. And then the question, but where do I find these things? So you're more likely to find these at smaller and local nurseries. Um, another really good tip is you can call that nursery ahead of time and ask them, do you have this species? And I would recommend using the scientific or botanical name because there are a lot, like I mentioned before, thimbleberry can mean two completely different, well not completely different, but can mean two different species. But if we use the scientific name, that's probably what the nursery uses anyway. So that's what they're gonna be most familiar with calling it. Also, um, if you really are very passionate about helping wildlife and pollinators, um, then maybe consider looking for straight species instead of cultivar species. Um, so I would much rather people plant a yard of all native cultivars than plant non-native and invasive species. But um, the best thing for wildlife is to plant straight species. So um, look for those. And a lot of the smaller nurseries do have them. And if the nursery that you go to doesn't have these, make sure you're asking for them. Make sure you're writing them. Make sure you're talking to managers there and telling them. Because um, I can tell you, when I started this job almost 10 years ago, this stuff was a lot harder to find. It is a heck of a lot easier to find native plants now, and it's because nurseries are a business. They gotta make money, and if they know that selling these plants will make them money, then they'll do it. So you gotta ask for it. The other option is to grow your own. And you say, but what about my neighbors or the HOA? I'm not comfortable being that neighbor. Maybe you are. Um, so start slowly. If you do have an HOA, maybe present your plan to the board. Maybe keep it small to start with and then slowly expand. Um, invite your neighbors into your yard and talk to them about it. Oh, this might look a little different, but this is why. Keep paths and edges tidy. A tidy edge means it's cared for, means that somebody it's not an abandoned lot that's going to affect their property value. Um, a nice, neat, tidy path means that somebody cares about it. Um, pay attention to the height. You know, maybe don't go full tall grass prairie in your front yard in your very neat and tidy development. It probably won't go over well. Maybe keep that in the backyard and just plant some shorter native plants in your front yard. <laughs> um, and maybe let it sit and let people get comfortable with it before you move on and plant more things. Other resources. So we've just given you a very quick overview of a lot of things, um, but there are other resources. So. Um, you could like look for this person, so that's me. <laughs> um, there's lots of really good books. So uh, plant, my picture is apparently over top of this one right now. Um, so the book that is supposed to be there is Planting in a Post-Wild World. Highly recommend that book. 
Um, it's kind of a totally different way of planting a landscape. Um, and it really is for long-term, low-maintenance landscapes is kind of like the whole goal of it. Uh, so, don't know if this one is Bringing Nature Home or, but it's one of the Doug Tallamy books. So any book by Doug Tallamy will not send you wrong. He's kind of the person who started this whole native landscaping boom that we're having right now. Uh, next is like the living landscape is another really good one. Garden Revolution. There's a lot of really great books out there that are about this. They can give you good ideas, maybe give you ideas for um, species that go well together. There are plant sales. So you're th wondering where can I find some of these things? So Lake Soil and Water, we have a plant sale every year. We actually have two now. Our one is tomorrow, but you already had to pre-order it. Um, but uh, look out in April, we, were, we will be doing another one. Uh, order forms will be going out in December or January, so pretty soon. And those are mostly bare root trees. We do a few container things too. So this is just to show you a little bit of inspiration. So here's June 2020. This is my friend Amy's yard. So she planted some native plant plugs. That's another good way to get 